Good evening, everyone. I um, guess I should load my talk. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'd just like to say uh, my PhD takes me up north, and uh, I study climate up there. And to have the opportunity to go down south and learn a little bit about the climate in Antarctica has truly been a pull-to-pull -pull experience. <laughs> so my presentation is going to look at uh, Antarctica. It's going to look at the dynamics in Antarctica. Um, climate changes. Uh, it's not static. It's been different, as we've already seen. We've had dinosaurs on Antarctica. Um, and so climate has changed. And so the glaciers have been set on Antarctica at this point in the story. So how are they going to change, respond to a different climate? When you think of Antarctica, you think of ice. And you think of a lot of ice. And that's a pretty good uh, definition of Antarctica. It's the largest glacial system on our planet. But as Canadians, I need to give a figure that you guys can understand. And seeing as it's playoff season, I thought I'd put it in terms you could understand. There's over 78 trillion hockey rinks worth of ice on Antarctica. And so quite a bit of ice. And the greatest fear right now is what happens if that ice melts? Well, if that ice melts, it's going to go directly into the ocean. And as we see, the ocean currents are density driven. So if you freshen up the ocean, you're going to change the ocean circulation. But not only that, even a greater concern is you're going to raise those sea levels. And so what does raising sea level mean? Well, we all know Florida. It's a nice place to go for a vacation. So is Cuba. And so what would happen if Antarctica completely melted? Well, you can expect a 60 meter sea level rise. Things look a bit different. So this is something that is very concerning and a lot of researchers are looking into. Well, the question is, is Antarctica going to completely melt? Well, let's look at the system, shall we? Let's see what's going on in Antarctica. And as a geologist, the first place we're going to start is the bedrock. So this is a topography map of, uh, of Antarctica. And you can see a stark difference between the east and west side. So on the east side, you've got nice greens and yellows. And on the west side, you have nice whites and blues. But what do those mean? Well, let me highlight that scale bar for you. The greens and yellows signify above sea level, while the blues and whites signify below sea level. And you see those really bright colors in the middle? Well, that's a mountain chain that separates the two. But this topography has a really large impact on the glacial systems. In fact, there are two different glacial systems. The eastern side is considered a terrestrial glacial system because it's above sea level. It's not really interacting with the ocean. While the western side is below sea level, so it is interacting with the ocean. So if the ocean changes, if it rises, if it warms, it's really going to affect the western side. So if you look at the temperature record over the past two decades, we also see a difference between the west and the east. On the east, you have nice hues of white and blue. If you look at the temperature scale at the bottom, you can see that that's a general cooling or staying at zero. And for the eastern Antarctic sheet, where most of the ice is held, it's pretty stable. You do see some uh, warming on the margins, but overall, it's pretty stable. Well, on the western side, it's a completely different story. This one is, is uh, warming up. You can see down towards the south, a lot, of, a lot of red. But if you look up to the peninsula where we were, that's where you'll see the most red. And the Arctic uh, Peninsula has seen the greatest warming uh, out of all places on the planet Earth. And so I'll be talking about the Larsen B shelf you can see up there. And if you imagine, um, just, in the middle of, uh, oops, just in the middle of here, there's a place called Vostok. And they took an ice core there, which I'll use to show you the temperature. But you can see that there's two different systems here. So I go back to this question. Is Antarctica going to melt completely? Well, we know the eastern Arctic sheet is above sea level, hasn't really seen significant warning. We know the western sheet is below sea level, has seen it, and is also sensitive to ocean changes. So I'm going to focus on this, and this is where a lot of research focuses on, mainly because this is the most unstable, and it's also the most likely to melt. So what's a glacier all about? Well, a glacier is a big chunk of ice on land. But more than that, it it has some sort of movement, some sort of, it grows, it shrinks, it, it expands, it retracts. And so you have your accumulation zone. This is where the snow falls. This is where things build. But due to gravity, ice also migrates. And so the ice migrates down, and it goes to the lowest point. So you're going to want to go down to the ocean. Now, there's an important point here called the grounding line. And basically, this is where the ice floats or where the ice is on the ground. And this line shifts through time. And so you can actually track the growth and expansion of, uh, of, a, of a glacier. And this is how climatologists uh, actually figured out how big the ice, ice was in the past. I'll get to that in a second. When the ice actually moves out onto the ocean and floats, that's what we call an ice shelf. And on the, we on the uh, western Antarctic, this is very important, uh, these ice shelves. And so on the edge of the ice shelf, that's where you get um, the breakage of big icebergs. And we were lucky enough to see a lot. In fact, one of them we saw was a large tabular iceberg. It's called tabular because it looks like a table. It's nice and flat. So these are just big square cubes of ice. Now when I say big, I mean big. 
Just that section that's exposed out of the water was 7.5 stories tall. That's incredible. And we were pretty blown away by it. But not only that, we all know that icebergs, tip of the iceberg as we heard at the beginning of the talk, um, only show 10%. So if we actually calculate how large that iceberg has to be, it's about 75 stories tall. So this thing was massive. And also, that's not the entire length. There's more off camera. So anyway, we were lucky enough to see that. Now, how does this ice migrate from the top of the accumulation zone down into the ocean? Well, think about how it works here. We have rain that falls. It falls on the ground. It collects in stuff we call catchments. These catchments focus the water into streams and rivers. And these streams and rivers take the water out to the ocean. Well, if you replace that water with ice, you have these ice streams. And that's exactly how it works on Antarctica. You have these ice streams that carry ice from the accumulation zones out into the ocean, and they form these ice shelves. And you can see by the different colors here, it's just that how fast things are moving. If you look in the center there, you can see that it's kind of come to a standstill while other ones are moving faster. And that's really the story of Antarctica. It's not just one story. There's, depending where you are, the story changes. And so here's just an illustration of the direction of flow. Now, uh, NASA, they uh, love to do science, and we love them for it, uh, basically has sent up a satellite, ISAT, and all those lines you see cross uh, cutting this, uh, the continent here are satellite runs. And they've been taking measurements. And what these colors mean is just the change in elevation. And so if you look at the blues, that's a po it's positive, so it's increasing. If you look at the reds, it's decreasing. And so as you can see, um, on, the, on the eastern side, it, it's you know, yellow, maybe blue. Uh, around, and then, but as you get onto the margin on the eastern side, you start getting into the reds. And into the peninsula, you get even more reds. And what this tells you is that that side is, 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 is thinning. It's uh, losing mass, as we all know. Now, Antarctica has also shown some other dramatic evidence. In 2002, a large uh, piece of the Larsen ice shelf broke off. So this, this was about the size of Rhode Island, which is 3% bigger at low tide. Um, broke off uh, in dramatic fashion in over 35 days. And as you can see, uh, towards the bottom and even in the blow up here, it, was, it just broke all apart. And so floating ice shelves don't actually have a direct effect on sea levels. If you think about your piece of ice in, in water, it's already displaced its weight. It's already had its effect. And that's the same thing with these ice shelves. But they might have an indirect effect, something called a buttressing effect. So if you go back to this diagram here, we can see we have the ice migrating. And when the ice shelf is there, it sort of slows, impedes the movement of these ice streams as they hit the ice shelf. What happens if we remove it, like in the Larsen B ice shelf? Well, there's nothing really to impede it. And so a lot of research is pointing towards this idea that these ice streams will actually increase in speed and move more ice towards the ocean. And so with these ice sheets, uh, the stuff that's on the ground, if that starts moving into the ocean, that's when you're going to start seeing uh, changes in sea level. And so as you can see, Western Antarctic, most vulnerable, uh, this idea of a buttressing effect, and also the peninsula being the one with the most dramatic changes. Where else can we look for information? Well, as a geologist, we like to look to the past. So this big arrow here is just to kind of show where we're going from the past to the present here. And so this is a temperature record of the bottom ocean temperature. So deep in the ocean, what was the temperature record? It goes all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs. Um, well, maybe not that far, but 60 million years, almost there. And so you can, as you can see, it started, bottom ocean was about 12 degrees. But over that time, it's actually gotten cooler. And as it's gotten cooler, you start seeing in the top right there the initiation of the East Antarctic Sheet. You start seeing the Western Sheet come about, as well as the Northern Hemisphere Sheet. And so this is all has to do with this general cooling trend. And so now I want to focus more closer to present. We'll look at the last 400,000 years. So that Vostok place I showed you, right in the middle of the heart of Antarctica, they basically took an ice core from there and actually found out what the temperatures were. And you'll start noticing a pattern here. And this, this, the fact is that this is not the first time we've been in interglacial. It's, not, it's happened repeatedly before. And so this is where, I'll show you again, uh, past, to pre, uh, past to present here. And this is where we are right now. This is our interglacial. So we're between glacial periods. And, yet, and the interglacial periods have happened before, repeatedly. You see these spikes. And they almost happen at regular intervals, about every 100,000 years. We've also had repeated glacials before. So it's this oscillation that just keeps on happening back and forth. If we focus in on what was going on in the last interglacial, it might give us an idea of what to expect in our interglacial. So uh, when they look at the, the record, they see that there was actually less ice on Antarctica in general. They also see that the global sea level is actually higher than it is today. And also that, in particular, the western Antarctic sheet was much smaller than it is today. If we look at the last glacial period, 
uh, we see the exact opposite. This is when the ice rules. Um, all, all the water in the oceans get locked up onto, onto continents, onto Antarctica. And so when you freeze up water, you have a drop in sea level. And the ice sheets, of course, are much higher. And this is just a nice map of the glacial extent of Antarctica during the last glacial maximum. And so you can see that the ice expands all the way out to what we call the continental shelf, right towards the ocean basins, so much larger. Another point you can see is these different times, these different ages. And this goes to show you that not all Antarctica reacts at the same time to the same things. There's, there's a different story around Antarctica, depending where you are. So when we start thinking about how it came to the present time, the ice has to melt. And actually, our northern hemisphere, the, the, the glaciers that were covering us before, actually started melting before Antarctica. This melting ice raised the sea level to the, the, the times we see now. And if we look to other previous interglacials, the western Antarctic ice sheet didn't, never melted completely. It survived this rock record I talk of, what are the clues we use to find out, you know, was there a glacier or was there not? Well, funny enough, you can use penguins. So penguins need bare rock in order to hatch their young. And so if you find a penguin rookery in the rock record, well, it tells you there's no glacier there. And so when you start seeing these penguins uh, living on the rocks, you can make a safe assumption that there was no glacier there, and you can start tracking the retreat of the glaciers. Penguins don't only tell us that. Uh, we were fortunate enough to actually see uh, another clue that penguins can tell us, more so to the present here. Adelaide penguins like it cold. Um, they, uh, they like colder temperatures and were more abundant in Antarctica uh, 30 or so years ago. But uh, there's a new penguin in town, these gentoos. And so these gentoos are moving in because, especially on the peninsula where the, the temperatures are warming. And these guys don't mind a little bit of warm temperature while the Adelaides either have to move further closer to the, to the continent or just be pushed to the side. So what does the past tell us? Well, it tells us in the past that during the last interglacial, it was warmer, Antarctica was smaller, and, it, and also the sheet has never really melted completely during uh, previous interglacials. Now, what can science tell us? What's the bottom line? Well, science doesn't give bottom lines. Science gives best, likely most scenarios. So this is the best I'll do here. West Antarctica will most likely continue to melt, uh, especially on the peninsula. And as a result, the sea level will rise. But how much and when, well, you know, this is all up to guessing and research. And the amount will largely depend on what the ocean's doing. Is the ocean, are the temperatures rising? Um, and are the temperatures that we're going to experience uh, in our lifetime or in our children's lifetime, are they going to exceed that of previous interglacials? Because if that happens, then we have no uh, rock record to tell us what will happen. And so let's see what six meters look like. If we assume that Western Antarctica are melted, this would be what six meters looks like. It doesn't look as bad as, as, 50, as 50 meters or 60 meters of sea level rise. But if you look at the number of people who might lose their homes, especially here in Canada, 400,000 people. All right, we might be able to uh, you know, make room for them. But if you look globally, over 92 million people might be shifted due to rising sea levels. So this is definitely a topic that needs more research, and uh, I think uh, you'll, you'll see that. And that's what makes Antarctica so interesting. It's not just isolated at the bottom of the Earth. It actually plays a large part in uh, what the Earth is doing. Thank you.